Hello, La Trobe University. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today about one of my favourite things, and that's all that wonderful data that's locked up in our galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Now, if you would like to follow along with my slides today, please do. Uh, that's the link to the slides, and uh, I'll probably be tweeting this out probably as I speak as well. So uh, have a look at Twitter and you can grab that link. Okay, so at least once a day, I reckon I go along to this site, Trove. Um, you probably all know about Trove. Do you all know about Trove? Trove is the, uh, the a discovery service created by the National Library of Australia, but it's much more than that. It's, um, it's a collection of collections. It's a repository of digitized uh, sources, such as books and journals and maps and photos. Um, and it's most well known as a, a collection of more than 200 million, I'll say that again, 200 million digitized newspaper articles from 1803 onwards. So I go along to Trove, I type things into the search box, uh, I browse a list of search results and uh, look at the individual items. Um, you know, maybe I'd work through my, my list of search results uh, and find 20 or so items which, which seem like they, they could be relevant, save them for later, do something with them. And that's great. And that's, that's the way we work with digital resources, right? We type things into the search box, uh, we find stuff that's interested, uh, interesting to us, and we keep it for later. And that's great. My question is, what about the other three million? I mean, digital collections really weigh, raise these questions of scale and meaning that we're, that we're really still trying to grapple with. Uh, and this, to me, is one of the reasons why we need to look beyond the search boxes and, and work with collections as data. What I'm talking about, really, are new ways of seeing the collections of our libraries, archives and museums that, that aren't constrained by these carefully designed web interfaces that we're so familiar with. And once we start to access collection data directly to work with that data, we can start to do different things. We can shift scales. We can zoom right out and look at a whole collection and then focus back in on a particular item. We can look for patterns that we can't see just you know in a list of search results on a page. We can extract features and structures, things like names and places and dates. Um, and we can make connections between data sources to see where they overlap or connect. But what do we need to work with collections as data? Um, you know, what are the requirements both of researchers and of institutions? <coughs> the always already computational project um, has been going in the US for a, a few years um, to look at these sorts of questions about how we develop and use collections as data. And they've developed a series of studies of personas um, and guidelines and is currently now supporting uh, some cultural institutions in the US to, to make more of their data available in a form that, that researchers can use. But it's not simply a case of researchers using the data that GLAM institutions provide to them. There's a lot of to and fro. There's a lot of blurring along those sorts of lines of responsibility. Researchers, after all, can enrich GLAM data. They can repackage it in ways that make it more accessible. So it's not just a matter of waiting for collections to be made available to us in a well-structured, consistent, beautifully documented way. Um, it's a matter of us thinking now about what we can do to help make this happen. But first, let's have a quick look at some examples of what does become possible once we start looking at GLAM collections as data. Um, <coughs> I'm going to open up this, this particular notebook live now. Um, and we're going to have a look at that answer to that question of what about those other 3 million newspaper articles. I'll talk a, a little bit later on about the platform that I'm using at the moment. Um, but all you really do need, need to know at this point is that there's uh, nothing up my sleeves. Um, I'm running code and I'm going to access data live from Trove before your very eyes. Um, and I can do this because Trove makes a lot of its data available through an API, an application programming interface. Uh, and an API delivers data in 
a machine readable form, a form that computers can do things with. Uh, the easiest way to think about it is that, you know, websites, as we're familiar with them, they're built for humans to look at. APIs are built for computers to use. So let's repeat our search for radio um, using the API. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to type in radio down here. Uh, it's probably a bit hard for you to see, but you'll have to believe me. Um, uh, but this time, instead of actually asking for a list of search results, um, I'm going to ask for the number of matching results per year. Uh, and I'm just going to run some of these bits of code. It's now going off to the Trove API. It's making a series of requests, one for each decade since 1800. Uh, it's getting the data. Let's have a look at the data that's collected. So there's the years and the number of results. We can find out which year had the most results, which happened to be 1941. And we can display a simple chart. Um, OK, so here we have a chart showing the number of newspaper articles which match that search for radio per year. And we can see, not surprisingly, that it takes off around 1920, but it also raises quite a lot of questions. And probably uh, the most obvious question is what terrible disaster befell the radio industry in 1955 that caused all mention of it to disappear almost? Was it the pending impact of television? People just stopped talking about radio. No, of course not. Um, obviously. There's some underlying features of this data which we don't yet understand to make that happen. So what we can do is zoom out a bit. As I said, we can change scale. So instead of looking at our particular set of search results, let's zoom out and look at all of the articles in Trove. How many articles per year, newspaper articles per year, are there in Trove? And we do, we get everything by searching for an empty space. So that's just an empty space there. Going to run that. Again, it's going off live to the Trove API, bringing back all that data, which is going to tell us about the number of articles per year. Uh, and once it's finished, we can create a chart showing us the number of articles per year. OK, so one thing we can immediately see on comparison is really that that drop-off in 1955 had nothing to do with the death of radio. It was, in fact, due to copyright. Um, basically, the, um, uh, the, the National Library has confined uh, most of its digitization efforts to the period before 1955, basically just to manage the risk of, of copyright infringement. Um, and it's created this, this wonderful feature here, which I have named the Copyright Cliff of Death, or, or perhaps that should be Copyright Cliff of Death. Um, and it you know, looks like a cliff. Um, so that's underlying our searches in Trove. And you may also be wondering here about this little peak here in 1915. I mean, what's going on there? Um, and that's actually due to uh, the prioritization of the digitization of World War One era newspapers in the lead up to the war war centenary. So it was decided to spend more money on World War One newspapers. More World War One newspapers were digitized. There are now more World War One newspaper articles in Trove. These features, the copyright cliff of death and uh, the World War One effect. I mean, they impact on any search that you do in Trove. But they're difficult to see when you're, when you're using the standard web interface. Working with the data directly in this sort of way, we can start to see how the collection itself is constructed. Anyway, so it's clear that the raw number of uh, search results on itself isn't terribly useful just because of these sort of underlying distortions. But having now got that total number of results, we can calculate uh, what proportion our search results are of those total number of articles uh, by merging our two data sets, and then we can chart the results. So here's our original chart here showing the raw number of results, and here's the same search as in searching for radio, but showing the results a proportion, as a proportion of the total number of articles. And we can see there are similarities there, but also uh, some significant differences as to where the peaks occur, and of course what happens after 1955. Um, of course, there's other things we could do. Uh, we could compare 
uh, the occurrence of radio to other terms. So here's radio, telegraph, and wireless, for example. So we can start to look at uh, uh, changes in language or changes in technology over time. And there are other things we could do. We could look at, uh, this is a comparison of, of uh, different states, uh, New South Wales and Victoria, uh, for a different search. In that case, it's for Chinese. Uh, we could compare different newspapers. This is looking at the word worker across a number of different newspapers. Um, but we don't just have to look at uh, our results over time as line charts. I mean, there are other things we could do as well. So we might, for example, uh, create a map which shows the places of publication of all the newspaper articles in a result set. Um, we could, if we wanted to, create little thumbnails for all the newspaper articles in our result set, uh, glue them all together and turn them into one very big, ginormous uh, news, uh, image. And this is in case what I've done here, or I've searched for articles which include the phrase White Australia Policy in their titles. Uh, there's about 3,000 or so of them. Uh, created a little thumbnail, stuck them all together and made this deep zoomable image. Okay, so we can do sorts of stuff, but eventually we'll probably get a bit frustrated with the data that the API is uh, just returning from its search index. That's the sort of aggregated data that we get back, you know, the number of results uh, divided up by the facets. Uh, you know, perhaps we might want to analyze the text of the articles in more detail. And in that case, we can use the API, but in a slightly different way. And uh, instead of getting that aggregated data, uh, access the individual records. Downloading the OCR text of hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of individual newspaper articles. Uh, and you can do that. This is a, a, a tool called the Trove Newspaper Harvester, which makes that process uh, much uh, quite easy. Um, so earlier this year, in fact, I, I downloaded a set of 200,000 newspaper articles, which included the phrase aliens. Um, and having downloaded those newspaper articles, um, I, protest, I processed the text within them to look for the word that occurred before aliens in the text, uh, and then had a look at how that changed over time. Um, and here we can see, just quickly, uh, or found particularly interestingly interesting the the rise of the the uh, the term undesirable before aliens, which you can see occurring around 1900, uh, of course, when the White Australia policy was introduced. Now, all the the code and the methods that I used in those examples have all been documented and shared using Jupyter notebooks. What are Jupyter notebooks? Well, Jupyter Notebooks that you can buy in code, um, results, charts, notes, images, and more um, into what's been described as a, as a computational narrative. Um, so it actually enables you to combine live bits of code, as we just saw, with, with uh, supporting text. Um, you might already use them. I mean, they've become quite popular in recent years, particularly with, uh, with people who work in, in data science. And uh, for scientists, you know, they offer a way of, of documenting both their methodologies and their computational environments, uh, the computational environments in which the uh, research was undertaken. So, so they make research itself more reproducible. Um, but for those of us in the humanities, um, I think they offer some really interesting opportunities for exploration and collaboration, um, ways of, of documenting our adventures with new sources of data. I particularly like the way that uh, Jupyter Notebooks bridge the gap between doing and learning. Um, the notebook I was using just before walks through the process of visualizing Trove newspaper searches over time, right? But you could just use it to generate charts. I mean, you could just plug in the search terms that you're interested in, and bingo, you have these nice little charts, these little visualizations. And you could do that without really uh, having to think too much about how they're created. But if you are interested in, in understanding how to use the Trove API, you can follow the examples and learn. So it's both a tool and a tutorial. Another neat thing about Jupyter Notebooks is you don't have to install any software to really get started exploring with them. Uh, there's a fabulous service called Binder, uh, which enables you, to, which basically spins up a customized computing environment for you and loads your notebooks. 
Uh, it's a really quick way of just playing around with a notebook that you find. Um, uh, Tinker is a, is a platform developed here by uh, the um, uh, Humanities and Social Sciences Virtual Laboratory. Uh, and again, it provides a, a, you just log in, create your account, and you can get your own uh, Jupyter Lab environment where you can start experimenting. Swan, which is part of Cloud Store, developed by Arnet, enables you to run your Jupyter Notebooks basically within the same space as you're storing your data in Cloud Store. So for certain type of projects, that, that uh, saves a lot of effort. And there are other services. Google has one called Colab. Uh, if you want to run something on your desktop, there's a piece of software called Interact, which, which will enable you to create and edit notebooks uh, on your desktop. And of course, you can just install Jupyter uh, it's just a Python package, so if you're happy with uh, with installing uh, packages on your computer, you can just install it yourself. Over the past year or so, I've been developing a collection of, of Jupyter Notebooks to help researchers explore collections as data, and it's called Glam Workbench. Uh, the notebooks, as you might see on the, the side there, are organized by institutional collection, but there's a few sort of general topics as well. Um, there's plenty of trove, of course, but not just newspapers, uh, books and journals and lists and much more. Um, this is an example of a, of a page within the notebook, that notebook that we just looked at, in fact, visualizing so trove newspaper searches over time. Uh, and there are links there which uh, uh, enable you both to view a static view using a service called NB Viewer. The static view means that you can't actually run the live code. You can just look at it. Um, but it's quick to, to load. Um, alternatively, as I said, you can use Binder to spin up a computing environment, load the uh, notebook in that environment, and you can actually run the bits of code live as I was doing. So if you click on one of these links in the Glam, uh, Glam uh, Workbench, you'll get a live notebook that you can actually use. So the notebooks themselves, they range from uh, quite detailed tutorials, like the, the one that we were looking at before, to what are really just quick hacks, uh, where I document a, a particular approach or workaround as I'm actually working on it. Um, providing a sort of wide range of different examples, I'm hoping uh, not only that people will find something that's useful to them, but also that they might inspire other ways of exploring collection data. Or indeed, other ways of thinking about what collections as data actually means. I mean, what are we talking about when we're talking about data in this sort of context? I mean, we talk about all sorts, different sorts of data, right? We talk about open data, structured data, machine-readable data. Uh, often in the humanities, we're more likely to be talking about or working with messy data. Um, just recently, I, I, I created a, a list which uh, uh, contains all the GLAM data sources that, that I could think of. Um, it's a work in progress and contributions are welcome. Um, and it's a real sort of mixed bag of stuff. Um, and as I was thinking about that and planning this talk, I started to think about the, the sorts of data that the, uh, the examples in the GLAM uh, workbench represent. And here's uh, what I came up with. We have machine readable, but coding required for download data. We have downloadable, but not easily findable data. We have structured, but not downloadable data. And we have downloadable, but in many separate pieces data. And these are the sorts of data, uh, glam data, that you find all the time in reality that you have to deal with. And they're the sorts of things, hopefully, that the glam workbench can help you with. <coughs> So, machine readable, but coding required for download. I mean, this is really where the Trove API sits, right? Um, the Trove API delivers lots of useful machine readable data, and it also supports things like large scale harvests, as, as, as we said before. So you, you can assemble your own data sets, but you need to write code to use it. You know, it's made for computers, right? So there's a big gap there between the data and the people who might benefit from it, who might want to do things with it. So the Glam Workbench provides a range of tools and examples that illustrate both the, the, the capabilities and some of the oddities of the Trove API. Um, and they include things like the Trove Newspaper Harvester, which, uh, which I showed before, um, that makes it 
you know, really quite easy to download thousands of newspaper articles. But there are other things. And this, this page, for example, is about Trove lists, which are things that users create. Uh, and the data from lists is available through the Trove API. So you can start to pull that out and analyze it and see what people are creating in their lists. Um, but there are other examples as well, other than Trove um, here. So uh, Digital New Zealand is sort of New Zealand's Trove, also aggregates metadata from a range of collections, makes it available through an API. Um, so I've created some examples, oops, sorry about that, created some examples there of working with the Digital New Zealand API, showing, for example, how you can, again, map the results, how you can visualize a search in their digitized newspapers in a similar way to my Trove examples. Um, there's also an exploration of the, the API from Te Papa Museum in New Zealand. So my aim is, you know, I, I mentioned that gap between the data and the people who want to use it. And my aim really with providing these sorts of examples is to try and close that gap a bit. Um, to show, show researchers what's really possible and give them some examples that they can then start to build on. So downloadable but not easily findable. There's more GLAM data out there than you might expect. Um, included in the GLAM uh, workbench is this notebook here, this harvesting GLAM, oh, in fact, this one, harvest GLAM data sets from data.gov.au. Um, so data.gov.au is the government data portal, open data portal. Um, and uh, uh, a few weeks back, I harvested all of the, the GLAM data sets from data.gov.au. Uh, and when I did that a few weeks ago, there were 948 data sets from 22 organizations. Um, we have the sort of lists of organizations there. You can see 204 data sets from the State Library of Queensland, 172 from the Queensland State Archives. Uh, we can also break them down by the type of data set. So mostly uh, they're CSVs, uh, uh, so text files, structured text files, licenses we can look at as well. Now, some of these data sets are more interesting than others, naturally enough. Um, but there are, there's some really rich historical data amongst them. Um, but of course, unless you know where to look, that can be hard to find. I mean, they're often buried really deep uh, in a in a uh, organizational website. And while data.gov.au uh, does have a good uh, search interface, I mean, how many people would think to to look there for data about libraries, for example? Um, so the Glam Workbench uh, links to both human and machine readable versions. Uh, of uh, the data that's been harvested. So there's a big long list of all those data sets. Um, uh, so you can actually access those CSV files. Um, but I have also created a way of having a peek inside all those CSV files. Um, I've created this thing, the Glam CSV Explorer. Um, uh, it looks like an app, but it's actually just a Jupyter Notebook disguised as an app. Um, and you just choose a uh, 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 one of the CSV files um, from the drop-down list, and it does its best to summarize each field, creating a series of tables and, and visualizations, which give you an overall picture of the sorts of data that is in that field. So there is lots of data there that we can just get in there and start to use once we know where it is. Other than Trove, the collection that I spent most time wrestling with is really that of the National Archives of Australia. Uh, the NAA's online database record search doesn't provide an API or any download options, in fact. So to get data out, you have to resort to a process known as screen scraping. Um, that's where you write some code to extract the data that you want from just ordinary web pages. I mean, it's a bit of a pain, but um, you know, the data and record storage search is really so rich and full of possibilities that it's worth the effort. Again, uh, as with APIs really, the problem is getting the data out of the NAA to the people who might want to use it. Um, so I've created a number of examples uh, which help people get that data out um, to harvest the contents of a, of a complete series, for example. Um, 
Uh, this is part of a project that I'm doing looking at closed files in the National Archives. Um, and I've also created a few um, pre-harvested collections of records. Uh, there's one that relates to uh, records uh, concerned with the administration of the White Australia policy. So it uh, it harvests all the metadata from those series and creates a series, again, a series of visualizations, tries to summarize the data so that you can get a picture of what's in all those all those uh, all those series. So that, I've done that for the White Australia policy records. I've also done that for ASIO surveillance files. So if you want a snapshot of ASIO surveillance files, you can also find that in the GLAM workbench. Um, and there's even a little app uh, which I, um, uh, I, I created using looking at the, the government functions, looking at which agencies perform which functions at uh, particular times. So you choose a function and you can see what agencies are involved. And that I was able to build that build that on top of data that I'd harvested out of record search. Uh, another example in this category are um, indexes which are created by the New South Wales State Archives uh, and their volunteers. I mean, they've done this fantastic work. They've developed these indexes which include things like names and places and dates and provide you know really interesting or useful entry points into the records. Um, but as well as that, they're just good data sets. There's just lots of rich data there that you can work with and visualize and connect. Um, <coughs> the indexes, they're openly licensed, they're online, they're searchable, but there's just no way of downloading them except by screen scraping. So I've uh, created a notebook, again, which harvests all the online indexes and makes them available as CSV files. Uh, and currently there's uh, there's 64 indexes containing uh, 1,499,259 rows of data. And look, you can get an idea of the sorts of things we're talking about here. This fabulous stuff. Um, and, you know, it, it just sits there being locked up in their, in their web pages because you can't download the data. Once you've downloaded the data, again, we can start to analyze it, find connections, find patterns. Um, and just again, to give you a taste of that, I did create a, a sort of version of the CSV Explorer specifically just for those index files. Okay, so next one. Downloadable, but in many separate parts. So as I mentioned early on, when we work with collections as data, you can play around with scale, zooming out from a, a single instance, look for patterns across thousands of files. But this is difficult if your only option is to manually download one file at a time. To make useful data out of our collections, sometimes you just have to bring all the pieces together. And Commonwealth Hansard is an example of this. Um, and here's another video, a video in a video where you can uh, hear me talk about uh, working with Commonwealth Hansard. Um, but Commonwealth Hansard is available from uh, the Australian Parliament website uh, through its Parliinfo database. But sitting underneath the Parliinfo database, its search interface, are lots of really well structured XML files. Great data! There's one XML file for each sitting day in the Senate and House of Reps. But you can only download them manually, one at a time. So uh, again, I've created a notebook which harvests all those XML files from 1901 to 1980, um, and they're saved in a separate repository. So all those separate files, those one uh, file per sitting day, they've all been brought together in a big corpus for large scale text analysis. Just by bringing together, we've really changed the type of resource that it is. Now, Trove, Trove's API is, of course, fabulous, but there's some important data that you just can't get through it. Um, the content of Trove's digitalized journals, for example, can only be accessed through the web interface. Um, I've created a series of notebooks to help you extract metadata, text, and um, digitized page images from the journals. Um, when I last ran that harvest, I downloaded OCR text from 30,462 issues of 384 journals. 
Um, so there's lots and lots of data sitting in those digitized journals. But again, at the moment, you can only get it one journal at a time, one issue at a time. You've got to download each issue individually. Um, so I've, I've, uh, I've downloaded all that OCR text from all those journals, from all those issues, and it's all sitting as a, uh, in a repository on Cloud Store. So you could pick uh, a journal like uh, Walkabout or The Bulletin or Pacific Island Monthly um, and download all the text from all the issues from that journal with a single click. So again, just bringing it together changes what's possible. My favorite example also comes from the bulletin. Um, after much trial and error, I was found a way to find and download um, the rather infamous full-page editorial cartoons that the bulletin uh, that, that were a, you know a real feature of the bulletin uh, through until from its origins in the 1880s through until uh, the 1950s. Um, I mean, it's all in a notebook. It's not a great notebook to learn from because it was all a bit patchy because um, uh, I, I really had to fiddle around finding a way that worked. Uh, but in the end, I had a collection of 3,471 cartoons like this. Uh, and that's uh, at least one for every issue published between the 4th of September 1886 and the 17th of September 1952. And again, all those images are now downloadable as a set from Cloud Store. And in this case, I took things a little bit further, um, and I compiled those images into a, a series of PDFs for easy browsing. Why? It's because I knew the images would be of great interest to groups, you know, like teachers, for example, who are unlikely to go digging around in the data sets. I mean, having pulled them out, there are opportunities to make them uh, more usable, more accessible. And that sort of is one of the main points uh, of what I do, of this talk, of the Glam Workbench. I mean, we talk about access as if it's just a matter of putting stuff online. But access is a process. It's a struggle. Giving something a URL is really just the first step. I mean, the bulletin cartoons, I mean, they were all online. But finding them would have taken a lot of clicking and browsing. Now anyone can just download some PDFs. If they want the original images, they can get them from CloudStore. The file names, in fact, on CloudStore embed uh, the metadata, uh, including the date, the issue number, and even the Trove object identifier. Access evolves through use. And we can all make a difference to that. We shouldn't wait for glam organizations to do all the work because they can't. The nature of access is shaped by our skills, our needs, our knowledge. There is no one-size-fits-all interface. And the reason why I get so passionate about things like the Glam Workbench and, and Jupyter Notebooks is that I see them as interventions in the construction and meaning of access. By sharing our work with collections as data, by sharing our methods, our tools, our results. We don't just make pretty charts or tables. We create entry points for others. Access is something that we build together. Thanks.